Good morning, friends. Good to see all of you. Thanks for coming out. Good morning, friends online. Good to see all of you online, and thank you for making us a part of your morning and uh, part of your coffee time. It's good to see you. I'm going to go ahead and just open up with a time of centering and prayer, and we'll open up our meeting that way. Let's center down, friends. Loving Christ, we hear your voice. We hear your voice in uh, the sound of the birds in the morning. We hear your voice in greeting one another. We hear your voice in the silence as we consider you and consider uh, the meaning of how your word speaks to the deep part of our hearts. We pray that throughout this meeting we would continue to hear your voice and follow and attend to that. Lord, we are open to your way. We are open to your word. We are open to your love. We thank you for bringing us here. We thank you that we can see you in one another. We thank you that we see you, Lord, in this place. In Christ's name we pray. Amen and amen. All right, friends. Shirley?
I have three selections to read. The first is taken from the 56th chapter of Isaiah. These I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar. For my house shall be called a house of prayer for all the peoples. Thus says the Lord God, who gathers the outcasts of Israel, I will gather others to them besides those already gathered. The next uh, reading is taken from the Gospel of Matthew, the sixth chapter. And whenever you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners, so that they may be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward. But whenever you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your father who is in secret. And your father who sees in secret will reward you. Finally, there's a short poem by Mary Oliver called Praying. It doesn't have to be the blue iris. It could be weeds in a vacant lot or a few small stones. Just pay attention, then patch a few words together. Don't try to make them elaborate. This isn't a contest, but the doorway into thanks. And a silence in which another voice may speak. Good morning, friends. Foggy morning. I think it's going to clear up and be another beautiful day, though. So you may have guessed by now that the topic this morning is praying. Now, growing up in the church, if you had asked me when I was younger, what is prayer, I would have said, prayer is talking to God. And that's probably how most people think of prayer these days. Well, I remember back uh, a few years back, I heard a popular speaker tell the story about the time he taught his small son bedtime prayers. And after being taught that, he would say to his family, good night, I'm going to bed now. Does anybody want anything? And I kind of thought growing up that that was what prayers were about, just asking for things, requests to God. Maybe thanks once in a while. But I've since learned that there's another kind of prayer that's kind of the opposite of talking to God, and it's listening to God. And listening to God is sometimes called contemplative prayer. And there are many names for it. Sometimes it's called prayer of the heart or silent prayer, or unprogrammed worship. But it's a form of meditative prayer that brings us into a sense of God's presence. We sit in the silence until the silence silences us. And then we're in a different state of <clears throat> awareness and we're open to the movement of the spirit. Mark referred to it last week as holy silence. I like that term. Now, different forms of contemplation are found in all religions. And in Christianity, the practice dates back to the very first centuries after Christ. And it was practiced for hundreds of years within monasteries, primarily. But after the Protestant Reformation, it tended to be lost within the Protestant church. 
until Quakers more or less rediscovered it in the 17th century. Quakers and some other groups too. And I would say in the 20th century, it was revitalized by the Trappist monk Thomas Merton. And he was trying to teach the monks in his monastery contemplative prayer because it had kind of even been lost within the Catholic Church. And there's a story about him that he wasn't really very well liked by his fellow monks because he told them that they weren't really contemplatives. They were just introverts. <laughs> I hope that's not true of Quakers. So I focus on prayer today because this text from Isaiah 56, 7, slide one, Bert. For my house shall be called a house of prayer for all peoples. This verse has been reverberating in my mind for a number of weeks now, and it keeps coming up in my thoughts and in my reading. And Jesus quotes it when he cleanses the temple in Matthew 21, 13, and it's quoted again in Mark 11, 17. And I've been thinking that a house of prayer for all peoples would be a good description of Reedwood, of Reedwood going forward in whatever new directions we might pursue. We can be a house of prayer for all peoples. I mean, we are a praying church. We take time to pray for each other. Um, we practice petitionary prayer and intercessory prayer. But we also practice a uniquely Quaker form of prayer, which is corporate contemplative prayer. And that's not practiced very much in other churches, so it's a kind of uniquely Quaker form of contemplative practice. And I want to explore that uh, this morning, but before we go there, I want to look at the context of Isaiah 56, 7. This portion of Isaiah is usually dated about 5th century BC, and it was the time when the Jews were returning from exile in Babylon back to Jerusalem and rebuilding the temple. They were trying to regain their national identity, which had been basically trying to be suppressed for many, many years. And so they were initially trying to promote a policy of exclusiveness. And the returning exiles were uh, rejecting foreigners, Samaritans, children from mixed marriages as part of the worshiping community. And they were having this dispute about who's in and who's out. We have those disputes today in our churches. And the prophet Isaiah says an astonishing thing. Slide two, please, Bert. He says, the most objectionable classes of people, foreigners and eunuchs, are to be part of the worshiping community. Quote from Isaiah 56, three, do not let the foreigner join to the Lord say, the Lord will surely separate me from his people. And do not let the eunuch say, I am just a dry tree. Foreigners and eunuchs, people who were the others, people who were most different, were to be excluded from the worshiping community. This pronouncement is a pretty radical break from the law that you find in Deuteronomy. You can look up Deuteronomy 23, one to three. We won't have time for that this morning, but if you do, you'll see it's pretty clear that eunuchs and foreigners were not to be part of the worshiping community. But as Daniel Smith Christopher reminded us two weeks ago, the Bible does not speak in one voice. Isaiah is saying times are different. Something is different now. Those who are sexually different, the foreigner, the non-Jew, those who had been the enemy, they're to be included in the worshiping community. Not just neighbors, but actually worshiping together. And so the prophet is envisioning a kind of multicultural, multi-ethnic, 
multiracial church of all peoples. So I see two key points in this passage that are, I think, relevant to us as a community. And one is being a house of all peoples, being uh, a place that's welcoming and hospitable to all peoples. And two, being a house of prayer, or what I would call becoming a contemplative community. Now, in our last monthly meeting, Sean Conley, when he was giving his report, reminded us that we have what he called, and I think I'm quoting you correctly, Sean, an intact tradition of contemplative practice. And some of you might wonder, well, what, what exactly does that mean, and where did that come from? Next slide, Bert. Well, a wonderful colleague of mine when I was teaching at Earlham School of Religion was Michael Burkle, and he's written a number of books. And one of my favorites is one called Silence and Witness, the Quaker Tradition. And he says that there are two pillars of Quaker spirituality. One is silence and one is witness. And then he also writes in his book, he says, our witness grows out of God's leading as encountered in contemplative worship. So he's really tracing our form of worship back to the 17th century when Quakers first began practicing it. Slide four, Bert. So one of my favorite old Quaker writers is Isaac Pennington. I know Mark enjoys Isaac too. He wrote a lot, he was a pro prolific writer. And he told his readers, be still and wait for light and strength and desire not to know or comprehend, but to be known and comprehended in the love and life. It's a pretty good description, I think, of contemplative prayer. And he also described their manner of worship. He said, this is the manner of their worship. They are to wait upon the Lord, to meet in the silence of flesh, and to watch for stirrings of his life and breaking forth of his power amongst them. And my favorite description of prayer, this is more about private prayer, also comes from Isaac, who says, bow daily before God and wait for breathings to you from his spirit. Now these lovely quotes, I think, really describe Quaker contemplative practice and our corporate uh, practice of silent worship. But they don't tell us exactly how to do it. Quakers didn't really write comprehensive guidebooks to how to center down into the silence and what to do in the silence. They didn't have bullet points that express exactly how you do this. So Quakers have practiced a variety of methods for centering down over, over time, and you probably have your own methods for doing that. But about 25 years ago, I was surprisingly introduced to an old Quaker book on prayer called A Guide to True Peace. Next slide, Bert or as the subtitle reads, The Excellency of Inward and Spiritual Prayer. And I have a, a copy of it right here. It was published by two anonymous Quakers in 1813. And it was this little pocket-sized edition so that Quaker ministers could carry it in their pockets when they traveled. And it was reprinted numerous times throughout the 19th century kind of fell out of favor a bit in the early 20th, but then began to be reprinted again by Pendle Hill, which is a Quaker press, and they published this, this little book. I don't think this is in print now, but it's still alive on the internet, if you want to check it out. Now, I will say that some of the language, because it's from the 17th century, isn't language we might necessarily use today, but it's full of beautiful gems. And what's so interesting and surprising about this little book on inward prayer is that the method it teaches, it does teach a method for contemplative prayer, was actually borrowed from Catholic mystics of the 17th century. And their names were, if 
Francois Fenelon, Madame Guillon, and Miguel Molinos. And they were called quietists because they taught what was called the prayer of quiet, and that's another term for contemplative prayer. And they were writing on the continent in French in the 17th century at the same time that Quakers emerged in England in the 17th century. And another interesting fact is that most of the extracts or paraphrases from these three mystics came from the woman, Madame Guillon. That's a drawing of her. And she was a fascinating woman. She was a lay woman. She wasn't a nun. And she was basically teaching contemplative prayer to lay people, doing what we would call prayer retreats at the time. And she was actually persecuted and thrown into the Bastille for so doing that, um, as was Molinos. There was a lot of politics going around, so there were many reasons. But primarily, she was a woman who was teaching publicly to lay people, and that just wasn't done at that time, except by Quakers in England. So they kind of liked her because they really admired what she was doing. Plus, she spent a lot of time in prison, as many Quakers did as well. So at this time, though, in France, contemplative prayer was reserved for just monastics or clergy, not for lay people. So that was also a no-no. She was teaching it to ordinary lay people. So I think that Quakers could really relate to these 17th century French quietists as well. And they borrowed some of their methods, and they basically Quakerized them. They paraphrased them and set them in a Quaker context and within the Quaker community. But I think it's just so interesting that here back in the 17th century, we have a kind of an interfaith book on prayer. And Quakers went on to kind of develop their own distinct tradition of contemplative corporate practice. Now, some might ask, well, this is all very interesting historically, but did Jesus ever teach contemplative prayer? Well, I will suggest that he did. Slide six, Bert. So here's the entire passage. Now, give a little context for what was read this morning. But I find that it's very fascinating when Jesus actually teaches on prayer, and he taught a lot on prayer, he says to his disciples, beware of practicing your piety before others. But whenever you pray, go into your closet and shut the door and pray to your father in secret. Now, I don't think Jesus is talking about a literal closet here or a literal door. I believe he's teaching inward prayer. Going into your closet is going inward into your heart. And shutting the door is closing off distractions. That's how I interpret it. And it's a beautiful metaphor for contemplative prayer. And I believe that he is establishing what came to be known as contemplative prayer in the early church. Now, of course, on a little literal level, we often interpret this passage as kind of contrasting the Pharisees showy um, public prayer, sanctimonious prayer with true pious prayer. But I think on another level, it is really a metaphor for a powerful description of contemplative prayer. Because Jesus is just telling us graphically to go, go into that interior place in your heart and close, close the door and pray in secret, not with words upon words, but simply listening to God, resting with God in secret. Now, in secret might seem like an odd choice of words, but I would suggest that it means in silence. And it means this heart-to-heart -heart relationship with God, contrasting it with the Pharisees' public display of prayer. And our great early theologian, Robert Barclay, actually picks up on this, uh, the term secret, where he's writing in his uh, theology, his book of theology, he writes, inward prayer is that secret turning of the mind towards God, 
whereby we are secretly touched and awakened by the light of Christ in the conscience. I believe he is capturing what Jesus was teaching at that time. And I love the description that the psalmist gives of this type of prayer. It's found in Psalm 131. The psalmist writes, but I still my soul and make it quiet like a weaned child upon its mother's breast. My soul is quieted within me. I think the psalmist is giving us a beautiful metaphor of contemplative prayer. And so that's what I think Jesus is teaching, that type of prayer here that he calls secret prayer, which quiets the restless mind to open us to the movement of the spirit. And really, it provides the wellspring for all our actions, our attitudes, our decisions, and provides the empowerment for our ministry. And as Mary Oliver said in her poem, to create space for another voice to speak. But I want to say, though, that um, well, it is also interesting that after Jesus says, go into your uh, closet and shut the door, that it's right after that, he seems to, in my interpretation, kind of make a, a concession to the crowd and say, but, but if you really need words to pray, here are some words. And so he offers what we call the Lord's Prayer. So we need words to pray, but we also need to experience God in the silence, to let go and let God, as we say. And then I also want to make sure that we don't uh, mean that contemplative prayer is what is sometimes referred to as navel-gazing. It's not the opposite of action. And our early Quakers have something very valuable to teach about action and contemplation because they were extremely active. They were traveling all over the world, crisscrossing the ocean, teaching and preaching. And the extent of their travels back in the 17th century is nothing less than astounding. But their active lifestyle was really grounded in their regular practice of contemplative prayer, of waiting, listening, and it was, became kind of the essence of their corporate worship. And they became known uniquely for their prayer of contemplation, for going inward into their inner room. And I think it was this balanced rhythm, rhythm of both action and contemplation that gave them their spiritual energy. They were contemplatives in action. Now, some of you probably heard of Richard Rohr. He is a leader of, a founder and leader of an organization called the Center for Action and Contemplation. And he's often asked, what's the most important word? Is it action or is it contemplation? And he would always say the most important word is and. It's action and contemplation. So it's contemplation that prepares us for action. Lastly, I want to close with one story, slide seven, Bert. And it's about an experience of Quaker open worship from Howard Thurman. There's Howard up there on the slide. You can see he was African American. He was a minister, writer, he wrote many books. His most famous being Jesus and the Disinherited. He was also a civil rights leader. And that book, Jesus and the Disinherited, was very influential on Martin Luther King Jr. Howard wasn't actually a Quaker technically, but he studied with Quakers and he attended many Quaker meetings. And in a sermon that he preached back in the mid 20th century, he speaks of his personal experience of being in uh, Quaker worship, of uh, group silence in a very traditional Quaker meeting. And here's how he describes his experience. Nobody said a word, just silence, silence, silence. And in that silence, I felt as though all of them were on one side and I was on the other side, by myself, with my noise. And every time I would try to get across the barrier, nothing happened. 
I was just Howard Thurman. And then, I don't know when it happened, how it happened, I wish I could tell you, but somewhere in that hour I passed over the invisible line and I became one with all the seekers. I wasn't Howard Thurman anymore. I was, I was a human spirit involved in a creative moment with human spirits in the presence of God. So for Howard, his experience of Quaker worship proved to be the doorway to both his action and his contemplation. So contemplative practice, contemplative prayer, corporately allows us to experience not only oneness with God, but oneness with all of us that are gathered together, all of us seekers, as Thurman said. And I think that a, a regular practice over time transforms us. It shapes our actions. It shape, shapes our decisions. It opens us to, the, to love God and to love each other. And I think it's the essential practice for sustaining a true Quaker community. And it is, as this little book says, the guide to true peace. So this morning, as we enter into our open worship, uh, I'd like to begin somewhat differently. We usually have a query or queries to uh, reflect on. But this morning, I want to uh, introduce you to a short contemplative practice that I used to use in my seminary classes to introduce students to contemplative prayer. Many of them weren't really familiar with it, nor were they particularly appreciative of silence. So this is a little exercise. It's kind of an introduction to contemplative prayer. And I'm going to recite a, a short verse of scripture from the Psalms, Psalm 4610. And I'm going to repeat it a number of times. Each time I'll leave off one word, and there'll be a short silence. And then the last time, when there's just one word left, we will enter into our corporate contemplative practice. So take a deep breath, relax, center down. Think about this as God speaking to you through this psalm. Be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I am. Be still and know. Be still. Be.
move on from this from this message. There's a little spider right there. He's dodging me. <laughs> Friends online, do we feel clear? Good. Thank you so much, Carol, for the timely message and the teaching and uh, bringing us into that space of uh, the sermon of silence and the preaching of silence and the power uh, that happens there. Uh, I also appreciate the new word I'm going to be uh, bringing into my vocabulary to Quakerize. So I hope that we are, when we leave here, we all feel uh, freshly Quakerized. I like that. <laughs> that's, a, that's the name of a pro publication right there. <laughs> and I, uh, I also appreciated Thurman's uh, eloquence, uh, speaking of his experience of crossing, crossing the creative line, crossing over into the creative line. I hope that we were able to encounter that or to relate to that here in this time. We do want to uh, remember uh, items for prayer. Uh, if there is anything in particular that we want to uh, mention at this time, Peggy has a microphone. So is there any, any item that we want to mention? <clears throat> 